All right, well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. In an academic sense, I guess I'm sort of a grandchild of this institution. My thesis advisor, John Reppy, uh, finished his degree, his uh, bachelor's and master's degree here at UConn in 1956. And according to one of the UConn websites where John came back to give uh, a famous lecture here, his first job was as a graduate lab assistant for 75 cents an hour. So John must have known what all physicists know, which is that's not the path to get rich. But anyway, it's a pleasure. <laughs> to be here. I'd like to just add a little uh, segment to the story that Mark and David Ritter related about, you know, why is the sky blue? Well, of course, you know, Rayleigh scattering, what would any physicist say? Uh, I can remember one time seeing a rainbow with my wife and she said, ah, Roy G. Biv. And I said, Roy G. Biv? And she said, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. She's an artist. And I said, oh, I never heard that before. And she said, well, how do you remember the order of the colors in the rainbow? And I said, well, by their wavelength, of course. <laughs> so there's a special prize for family of physicists everywhere where the dreaded statement is, we could calculate that. <laughs> All right. So you just heard from Mark Ritter about the evolution of the innards of computers. And I think it's a very, very compelling story. It's a very interesting story. And it leaves you not only wondering what could we do with all that compute power, but quite frankly, how could we do without it? So let's dive into that a little bit more. And I titled the talk, The Evolution of Computing, because if I go back to the beginning of the last century, we moved very quickly from literally gears and wheels of the Babbage computer, to electromechanical relays, to vacuum tubes, to discrete transistors, to integrated circuits, and we've been in that paradigm for a long time. And as Mark described, there's an end of the road, and we joke sometimes that the end of the road has always been 10 years in the future, wherever you are uh, in, in time. And we've always drawn brick walls on our charts, and I was pleased to see that Mark had one on his chart this morning. Uh, but we know there's an end of the road because common sense says that if you're trying to build a computer with transistors as switches out of atoms, and the, atom, the transistors you're trying to build are trying to be smaller than the atoms, you're going to have a problem. You don't need a PhD in physics to understand that problem. So an evolution of computing is not only what computing could do, but how you could actually provide the power to make it happen. So let's talk about some of the trends that are common to all of us today. What's happening around us today? We have a revolution in mobile computing. Everyone here in the room is familiar with it. We've passed the point where we now ship more mobile devices, uh, phones and tablets, than we do PCs. They are becoming the dominant computing form factor, but we use them very differently than we use PCs and other traditional computers. They're with us all the time. Uh, and in human terms, we have a much more intimate relationship with these mobile devices than we do with our PCs. If you think back a long time ago, it's almost like the pocket watch of the days of old. What's the thing you pull out of your pocket and look at the most frequently? It's probably your mobile phone, and it's sometimes to check the time and it's sometimes to do lots of other more interesting things. We've done some research that says the average interaction time with a mobile device when you pull it out of your pocket or off your, your carrier on your belt is only about 70 seconds. And so it's a frequent companion that's used very rapidly throughout the day. Uh, at IBM, we use these devices a lot in our work. And of course, being a corporation, we're careful about security. So we have a requirement for very long passwords. And our researchers like to complain that a, a, a corporate compliant password for the iPhone takes longer to type than the 72 seconds they were going to interact with it. But that's another discussion. So mobile devices are a source of all kinds of information because, in fact, they're sensors about the real world. They have accelerometers in them. Uh, that can do things like judge how aggressively you drive, for instance, uh, know where you are. Uh, and going back to the comments Wendell made, you know, all that information we hope and, and we expect as consumers will be managed with uh, some degree of care by the providers that have that. But the devices have a lot of information about what we're doing, the context, where we are geographically, geospatially, what tasks are we doing. So the possibility to provide assistance and insight is vast if they can tap into very large data sources from other places. Cloud computing is a very well-known paradigm for virtualizing computation. It started out as a way to just use expensive capital equipment more efficiently, so to take a machine that might be only 5% utilized uh, in aggregate, which is typical of a, of a desktop PC, and then drive that utilization up toward 100% by sharing those devices. It's evolved into something much more powerful than just the economic argument. In fact, it's evolved into a paradigm for deploying computing that's more valued for its agility and its flexibility these days than anything else. 
Over on the right, the phenomenon of social media. We like to refer to that same phenomenon when it happens inside of an enterprise as social business, and those two worlds are a bit different. The social media public world is sometimes anonymous and sometimes not. The world of social business is much more identified in terms of users having real identities and real functions. But what it's really doing is taking a lot of human activity, who we interact with, how we interact, what are we thinking about, what tasks are we doing, are those tasks likely to be completed on the expected schedule. All of that information that exists in principle today rendered in a form of digital information, sometimes our mathematicians refer to it as a digital exhaust that comes out of what we do, and much like the analogy to a car, that exhaust has energy in it that we can use to turbocharge the engine. So by doing analysis on that digital exhaust, we can do all kinds of interesting things to help people collaborate with a broader network than they might have had, or to accomplish tasks more efficiently, or to get insight about things that are virtually inevitable to happen in the future if only we could pull together all the data sources. Down at the bottom of the slide, the revolution around analytics, the ability to get faster, better, cheaper computing, to do very, very deep mathematical analysis, essentially in real time, about a lot of physical systems, something that if you've seen the IBM commercials on various sporting events, we refer to as the revolution around the smarter planet. Now, uh, I don't think a TED talk would be complete without a graph something like this, looking at the explosion of data and comparing it to the number of stars in the universe. These are actually real numbers. We're not doing this just for fun. Um, and you are here. Uh, you can see how quickly data is exploding. This is happening because we now have pervasive wireless networking through either Wi-Fi or cellular. We have very low power devices and we can actually put sensors all the way at the edge of the physical world and bring us back an almost perfect digital replica of what's going on in the world. And so the revolution that's happened in, in purely digital industries, you know, like banking, for example, where you can represent all of the artifacts of banking as perfect digital replicas, is now, that revolution is now taking place in the physical world in things like petroleum exploration or mining or traffic management on highways because we have sensors that can give us that digital representation of the world in a way we can manipulate it, we can do pattern analysis, we can do discovery of repeating patterns driven by an underlying cause, we can then use that to predict when we intercept someone at step three of a five-step process, we can tell them that steps four and five are likely to happen in the future, so a lot of power comes from the ability to digest and understand this data. Now the trick, and going back to Mark's talk of what's exponential and what's linear, the explosion of data is exponential, but our ability to understand it as humans without some assistance is at best linear. So in fact, we have a growing gap here that a colleague of mine, Jeff Jonas, refers to as corporate amnesia, or uh, more colloquially, it's almost like we're getting more data, but we're not as able to do things with it. So really it's all about something that we're calling cognitive computing, which is the ability to understand that unstructured data, render it to a form that is understandable and comprehensible to humans, and second, to build machines that will interact with humans in the human domain, not to force us to learn a programming language or to learn a database schema and to step into the computer's world, but to have the computer have enough processing power to meet us in our world. Now, let's talk for a minute about a machine that we built a couple of years ago over at IBM Research that we called Watson. Uh, Watson was a machine uh, designed to test the premise that natural language processing and computing had advanced to a point where we might be able to compete successfully with humans on the TV game show Jeopardy. And it was a very interesting and very provocative thing to do uh, about four or five years before we started it. We had 30 years of natural language understanding and all kinds of science, of computer science, uh, language science that backed up our ability to conceive of that system. But when we started that four-year research project, it was truly a research project in the sense that we didn't know if it was possible to do it or not. We wanted to find out. One of the things that Watson did was answer general knowledge questions. So it could be a very broad field. A Jeopardy question could be on geography or physics or science or you know, passages from literature. So the first thing you have to do if you're going to answer questions is assemble a bunch of data that you hope contains the answers to the question. In that case, that's the 1x, the raw data, the information, the raw information we want to use. The next thing you have to do is analyze that many, many different ways. If we talk about 
sinking uh, the eight ball? Is sinking going into the pocket of a pool table? Is sinking something that ships do? There are many, many variations in the meaning of human language, and the machine doesn't really understand, so it has to generate a combinatorial explosion of all the possible meanings and test them against answers that might make sense. And so there's a very, very lengthy process of extracting metadata, data about the data, from the corpus. And so for the Watson system that played Jeopardy, that initial corpus, the Wikipedia, popular song lyrics, uh, the Bible, sports statistics, was only about 100 gigabytes, which in today's units is a modest amount of data. What we learned that was that the analysis we performed on that corpus to allow it to make sense out of it was 10 times bigger. Okay, so it was 10 times bigger metadata than data. So that's that first step of feature extraction metadata. As we've applied Watson to answering questions in medicine, what we've learned is there's another explosion of 10 or even 100 times where we gather related data and related data to that and related data to that. And the power of the machine is to bring all of that data into the context where the human decision maker is working. Let me give you a simple example of this. One of the physicians we worked with on moving Watson from the domain of the Jeopardy game show into medicine is Dr. Herb Chase. When Herb first was exposed to the early, early, early medical version of the Watson system, he remembered a case when he was a young resident of a patient that came in with a very strange disease and strange symptoms and was deteriorating very rapidly. And it's a lot like a famous TV show where the doctors were literally in a race for her life to imagine what was the affliction she had, how could we treat it, has anyone seen this before, do we have any clue of what we're going to do? And they, they went to every experienced physician they knew, they went to the medical libraries, they conducted conferences with colleagues all over the world, and literally did not think they were going to make it in this patient, they were gonna lose this patient before they found the answer. At the very last minute, a colleague said, you know, there's this obscure journal that had this paper five years ago, maybe you should go look. They read the paper, they made the connection, they saved the patient's life. A fascinating story. Uh, Dr. Chase loves to tell how that he and that patient became lifelong friends. Fast forward to today, the state of cancer treatment. It's another race to save people's lives where the race is how quickly can I accumulate the relevant information, navigate it, and understand it. If you take a cancerous tumor, you can actually sequence the genome of the tumor, and in many cases, you can actually identify the specific biochemical pathways that are causing the problem. You can then conduct a broad search for drugs that have what are called off-label effects, unintended side effects that turn out to be useful for something else, and it can take 30, 60, or 90 days to do that, which is not really helpful if the patient's only gonna live for five or six or 10 or 29 more days. So we literally have a horse race today at a factor of 10 to the 12th larger data sets than we're talking about that's literally a life and death proposition. So this context explosion is interesting and it's really where the utility of systems like Watson come in both assembling a large context and helping a human expert make sense out of it. So going back to my comments at the very beginning, we started the last century with tabulating systems with gears and wheels that could count and maybe could sort. Then we entered a very long progression of systems we called programmable systems where we automated processes and we wrote code and we executed programs. And now with our Watson system and other derivatives of it, we're at this precipice to this new world of cognitive systems, which principally are systems that are designed to understand and extract insights from data. So it isn't all about programming anymore to do the task, it's about programming to learn and learning by taking insights from larger and larger data sets of more and more relevant material to the context that that human being is working on at any moment. So we, we only see the Watson system and its immediate children as a first step into this very big world, but the world is really about getting all of this new data, all of this new context, and assembling it and giving us as humans a tremendous amplification of our instinct and our training to be a mile wide and to see data sources that we never could have amassed and navigated on our own. Thank you all very much.